Welcome on behalf of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung's Brussels office, as well as the Asia department of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Also welcome on behalf of Terre Solidaire, which is co-hosting this webinar. My name is Florian Horn. I work for the Rosa Luxemburg Brussels office on trade uh, policies of the European Union and will be guiding you through this seminar today. Um, the European Commission is lately pushing a lot to conclude a number of free trade agreements that had been negotiated sometimes for quite a while. The negotiations between the EU and the South American trade bloc Mercosur received quite some media attention recently, with government officials and policymakers from the EU traveling to the newly elected Lula government in Brazil. Less attention, however, is giving to the negotiations between India and the European Union. Meanwhile, India itself is also busy, busy negotiating FTAs. The eighth round of negotiations between India and the United Kingdom is scheduled for later this month. The talks between India and the European Union on a free trade agreement started in 2007, slowly progressed over a few years and then came to a halt in 2013. After a long silence and influenced by major shifts in the global geopolitical order, both parties are back on the negotiating, ta negotiating table since June 2022, with a lot of optimism to conclude the deal by the end of this year. Separate negotiations to the free trade agreement are being held on investment protection as well as geographical indications these negotiations were launched simultaneously. Next week here in Brussels, the uh, fourth round of negotiations between EU and India will take place. But we have to assume that contradictions that stalled the process of negotiations in 2013 have not disappeared. Therefore, it is worthwhile to discuss factors that may lead to a failure of the deal. And paradoxically, skepticism of free trade-oriented policies is growing in many places around the world, but at the same time, we hear a bit less from waves of people resisting against these free trade policies. So with this webinar, we also want to initiate a critical debate on how this trade, this trade deal, the EU-India deal, is potentially worsening the climate, the labor rights, uh, quality and affordable public services, as well as data privacy. Therefore, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung recently published two reports on the EU-India trade negotiations, one by Laura Ferhecke, which is uh, this one. You can download it from our website. The link is in the chat. And another one by Ranja Sigupta, which is this one, also available for download from our website, and the link should be in the chat as well. Um, the reports analyze the impact of the future free trade agreement on economic, social, and political governance in India and the EU, on what workers and citizens can expect from the agreement, and what effect it will have on the environment and access to services. So I'm very much on honored to present our distinguished speakers for today. Yesterday, we all celebrated the International Women's Day, which was established, by the way, by Rosa Luxemburg's dear friend, Clara Zetkin. And today we get started with Ranja and Laura, our distinguished uh, speakers and authors of the report, who will present their papers published by the Stiftung. The Stiftung, we say in German always, which would be in English, the foundation. <laughs> Um, after these presentations, there will be two expert comments, one by Dr. Biswajit Dar and the other one by Member of European Parliament Helmut Scholz. And I'm very sorry to inform you that just this morning, Chachati Ghosh had to cancel her participation due to personal reasons. After the expert comments, there should be time for some discussion with you, the audience. I would like to ask you, therefore, to put your questions and comments in the Q&A box so I can present them to our speakers. 
So please specify also which speaker or speakers you address on your contributions. Now let me go ahead um, by first introduce our first speaker, Ranja Singh Gupta. Ranja is senior researcher with the Third World Network. She has a degree in economics from Jawaharlal Nauru University in India, and her current work spans the UN 2030 Agenda, Finance for Development, Agricultural Institutions, International Trade and Investment Policy Making, as well as Globalization, Poverty and in Inequality. So, Ranja, with the EU India FTA, what is at stake for Indians, Indian farmers, workers, small enterprises? Which sectors will be affected? Could you please present the main findings of your report, development opportunities or challenges? Um, thanks, Florian. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to do the paper, actually, and also for the uh, webinar invitation today. And uh, I think in 10 minutes, it will be uh, difficult to present everything from the paper. So I'll uh, invite everyone to read it uh, along with the other paper by Laura. Uh, but let me quickly just, I mean, I think maybe I will start with a few broad points about the agreement from, you know, from the Indian development perspective. And then let me touch upon a few uh, specific uh, sectors or uh, issues. Uh, so, of course, uh, we know, I mean, the EU-India FTA is one of the most ambitious with a very broad coverage among India's, you know, other trade deals that it's negotiating. Uh, and, you know, as Florian said, it, the first phase of negotiations was 20, 2007 to 2013. But now it has come back, it's like bigger and it's more ambitious than before. There are newer chapters like e-commerce, energy, raw material, a bigger sustainable development chapter and so on. And uh, also chap new chapters such as on MSMEs, but some of these chapters, like the one on MSMEs, uh, it actually promises something positive for MSMEs. But if you kind of really analyze it, it actually has nothing new or it does not really deliver any additional benefits for MSMEs. My second point is, uh, as with other EU FTAs, we see that there is a deep intrusion into the partners policy space. And I think uh, for India, uh, what, I, when, what my analysis showed is that, you know, India's policy space regarding, you name it, I mean, seeds with uh, geographical indications, its investment policy, raw material protection policy, uh, sectoral development policies, government procurement, MSME policy, digital policy, uh, IPRs, etc. All these policies could actually be constrained and restricted by this FTA. The third point is that, you know, uh, as far as India's trade uh, policy positioning is concerned, and I know Professor Dhar will speak more about this later, but if India had to actually agree to what in EU's demands are, and we can see what EU's demands are because EU already put its proposals in the public domain, but of course it has been helpful for us uh, to analyze the text and uh, I mean, kind of try to understand what the implications would be. So if India had to agree to these demands, then India's own positioning at the WTO or in, in its other FTAs will be severely uh, kind of already predetermined and also constrained because, for example, India has not agreed to join e-commerce negotiations either at the WTO or any of its FTAs. Same with government procurement. India has not agreed to, uh, for example, this uh, environment and trade uh, agenda, which is being brought in at the WTO. So for good or bad, it would mean that if India agrees to this in the FTA with the EU, India will have to then kind of slowly agree to these commitments at the WTO or and in its other FTAs, right? So it would imply a clear shift in its trade policy positioning. Uh, and another interesting thing that I noted is that, you know, in the earlier phase of the negotiations, we had fought, I mean, civil society organizations had fought against many of the demands made by the EU, most notably on intellectual property rights and access to medicine. So there was a lot of criticism of you know, EU's demands for data exclusivity, patent term extension, and so on. 
and the and EU had then agreed to drop those demands. But now in this new phase, we see that all these demands have come back. Uh, the last point is that I think one thing that we should understand is that it is expected to increase inequality in India because there would be a lot of shifts that would be needed. For example, you know, uh, shifts between for workers between sectors, they, they need to move from, say, uh, you know, agriculture sector to other sectors. There would be a lot of job uh, adjustments. Those with lower skills or resources will be uh, will have much more problem. There would be rural urban shifts and small farmers, low skilled, semi skilled workers, MSMEs, patient groups, indigenous populations, women as a class, they will be having less access to healthcare, natural resources, critical services, finance, and so on. So uh, I think, and, and there are some reports which also point this out. For example, the European Parliamentary Research Service did a paper, and they also point that there, you know, there could be impact on adverse impact on inequality in India. Let me now quickly just uh, look at some specific issues, uh, but I will just, you know, move at the speed of light because there is, uh, there. I mean, we do want time for discussion and the other speakers. One is critical issue is agriculture, dairy, fisheries in India, because we are expected to lower our import duties. EU wants access to wines and spirits, dairy, cereals, meat and poultry products and fisheries products. And, you know, we are, we have mainly a uh, smallholder farming and small scale fishers. And dairy also, we have cooperatives which have very small milk producers. Many of them are women milk producers. So this cut in import duty is a actually a major challenge, I think, for these, these constituencies. But at the same time, uh, it's not clear whether India will be able to export more to the EU because of the standard barriers. And EU also gives massive agricultural subsidies, which cannot be discussed under the FTA. It can only be discussed in the WTO. And we haven't made any headway there. In addition, EU's you know, demands related to intellectual property rights, for example, on agrochemicals. They want TRIPS plus provisions. And then they want us to sign to the, the international agreement called UPOF 1991, you know, which protects uh, actually seed companies' rights more than farmers' rights. And we've seen many cases actually that challenges, you know, these rights, uh, co company rights. But by signing UPOF 1991, India will give away a lot of policy space again. And then EU also wants recognition of its geor geographical indications. And for, a, for example, like a you know, just a, a sector like dairy processing is just beginning to grow. This GI will GI issue will be hitting them hard. In addition, investment provisions, which could increase threat to land and natural resources would be an issue. And I think a last very important, interesting chapter that EU has thrown up is the sustainable food systems chapter. And that chapter, uh, really tries to get its partner countries to adopt a model of sustainable food system. And sustainable food system is something we all want. But if you look through what the content is, we are. I am very worried. And I think that worry will be shared by uh, Indian farmers groups and all uh, uh, at the same time. Because, you know, what it says is it, it has, it says that it's compatible with the SDGs, but frankly, I think it's at major conflict with SDG 2, which, for example, forwards advances small farmers' rights. But this uh, character, the this chapter that EU proposes actually says, for example, you know, an enterprise should be always profitable. Our small farmers are not or that you minimize subsidies and maximize tax from the agriculture sector. And these are not targets and objectives for us of a sustainable food system. We think it will create and harm, uh, create barriers for our small farmers and small scale farming and actually make them more uncompetitive and therefore giving EU market advantage. In manufacturing, of course, India has interest in textile garments, leather, chemicals, et cetera, machine parts, but the standards are again a huge barrier. And I think the for the MSMEs, the small and medium, small micro enterprises in India, they are actually interested in the EU deal because many MS, you know, SMEs actually operate in these segments, textile garment, leather, and so on, uh, gems and jewelry, and so on. But uh, I talked 
to the Federation of Indian SMEs, and they are very worried about the standards, because if the standards remain very high, and even the technical barriers remain kind of unbreachable for Indian MSMEs, because they find it a major challenge now. You know, I was, I work, I worked uh, on the leather industry in, uh, in India, and uh, one of them told me that if they need to export to the EU, they need to have a specific machine which is manufactured only in the EU and it is very expensive. And this is part of the standard that EU sets. So they buy a machine from China and they cannot export to the EU. So the standard issue is huge. And I think another major concern for the MSMEs is uh, government procurement. So with that, let me move on to the issue of government procurement, you know, this government purchase market, which is about 12 to 20% of the GDP in our countries. In India, I think it's more than 12%. And EU in all its FTAs wants access to this market, right? It's a major, it's like a core demand, core mandate for the EU. But uh, our countries, many developing countries, including India, they use it as a, a you know, policy tool for giving markets for MSMEs, for women's self-help groups, for marginalized constituencies. And if India has to you know, open up government procurement and EU, it's like a core mandate. So they will probably not sign without access to the government procurement market. Not only will this mean, as I said, that India has not given it in the WTO. So it would mean a, a pretty strong departure from India's current position, but also will India be able to protect these affirmative policies for you know, women's, women and other marginalized constituencies and MSMEs. And we know that the MSME federations are extremely worried and they are saying they will not, they do not want this FTA if it actually takes away these preferential treatment that they get, get under the government procurement uh, market. Uh, e-commerce, uh, I think e-commerce, e e this digital economy is big issue because again, it will undermine India's position in other trade arenas and EU wants free flow of data. EU wants that we should not impose any tariff on e-transmissions, no ban even on, gov uh, I mean, no ban even on government data. Everything should be available for not only European companies, but globally for all companies. So it means that Indian government cannot use the data uh, to, you know, create like specific preferences for specific uh, constituencies, for example, Indian startup companies, or, you know, that uh, create its own data policy. So it will severely limit again its policy space. In investment remains a major concern because India, you know, got, had faced uh, many ISDS cases and India's a model bit, like India now negotiates, it has a model uh, treaty. And this, what EU demands is actually very different from in, in many aspects from that model treaty. And finally, I think EU is saying that it is, you know, very interested to secure women's rights, labor rights and sustainability and environment. But the problem is that the substantive provisions in the agreement. And this is what we have fought for. We fought against the investor state dispute settlement because it has a major problem for environmental conservation. But these are not changed. These are not taken away from the FTA. And for example, if you take the example of gender, you know, agriculture, dairy, these are gender sensitive sectors, then gender uh, affirmative policies in government procurement or medicines for women under the uh, IPR chapter and, you know, uh, ensuring access to medicine for women, these are compromised. So there are substantive provisions in the FTA, which compromise many of these so-called objectives of the EU. So standalone, some chapters and some language will not correct that. So we see this as major double speak. And I will end here and uh, will, of course, look forward to comments and questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Ranja. Um, also for uh, keeping with the with the time limit. Um, um, that was a really fast presentation with a lot of info. <laughs> we tried to uh, to 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 uh, arrange it a bit uh, in the in the next um, in the next contributions. But we also heard already heard that uh, government procurement is a very sensitive issue. Um, that there's questions about um, how does it relate to India's stance in 
other uh, trade institutions like the WTO and so on. Um, and what the EU says it is intending and what it really intends. Um, and on that question, I guess we have a very good expert uh, now. That would be Laura Ferhecke. Um, hi, Laura. Um, hello. Look, hello. She's a former trade campaigner and activist who is based in Brussels, but she also teaches EU trade policies in Lille Catholic University and is independent researcher on EU trade deals for NGOs, trade unions, and also, of course, political foundations. Um, so, Laura, um, you wrote the other report for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung titled um, EU India Trade Deal Business as Usual. Can you elaborate a bit on what is the EU heading to? And Laura just started her um, PowerPoint, and I will just shut up and give her the time <laughs> to speak. Go ahead. I didn't mean to shut you up, Laura. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you also for the opportunity to look into the EU-India trade deal. Um, just to pick up on what uh, Ranija was saying, uh, I really agree with her. There's, there's a whole notion of inequality is important because sometimes we think about what's going to be the impact in the EU and, and in India. But I think that in both sides, uh, we see big business winning and a lot of inequality in, in both sides. And it's important to think also about this. Um, uh, I've been asked to answer, this is the report, and I've been asked to answer two questions, which would be the sectors will be impacted in the EU, and how can civil society respond to this? So, um, as uh, Rania was saying, there's a big thing about the digital sector. It's one of the main offensive interests of India. So, India would like to have access to the EU for also for its own digital companies, for its softwares, for its engineers, for all its IT companies to be able to uh, also work uh, in the EU market. Uh, what it means is that uh, we could see, for instance, in the health sector, some jobs being outsourced in India. So this is already something that has been witnessed with during the negotiations between the UK and India. But there's a big interest for some medical jobs to actually be made by uh, Indian workers. And I'm sure Indian workers are, can be very good radiologists, but it does raise the questions about the jobs that will be lost uh, in the EU. So the idea will be you could, for instance, do an X-ray in Romania, and it will be a, a doctor based in India that will be analyzing it. And then you'll receive the, the, the results next, yeah, the next day on your mobile phone, which will make it maybe faster, cheaper, but it does raise the questions about what it means for the jobs and also how the jobs will be made in India. And it's the same thing with the IT sector. India would like to have much more engineers to come and work in the EU. And the whole question is, how and what kind of conditions will they come in? So, so, so if we allow more Indian IT engineers to come to the EU, will they have the same working conditions, the same rights as EU workers? Because we don't want uh, this trade agreement in, to open like um, another labor market, you know, like the Indian engineers, if they come and work in the EU, should be treated like EU workers. So there's a whole question also about, about labor. And we know that it's something that is very... Um, uh, sensitive uh, with some certain member states and we know also for instance on the negotiations between the UK and India this is a main stumbling block where the UK is, is not willing to allow for more work uh, permits. Um, in the agricultural sector so as Rania was saying the EU is like it would like to export more especially more milk which uh, makes no sense. I remember not long ago um, a friend of mine told me it's like we would want to export more pizzas to India you know to Italy sorry uh, sending more milk to India doesn't make sense in, because India has a very big uh, milk sector and it also employs as you were saying Rania a lot of um, of women of small uh, uh, small uh, farms and small cooperatives, so it's it's a it's a well developed uh, sector already in India, and um, 
and here you would like to sell uh, some milk uh, from the EU, from big business, subsidized agricultural big business to India. But India will also like to export some of its agricultural products to the EU. And in this sense, it will be mostly rice, sugar and grains, which India would like to export to the EU. And again, as Rania was saying here, we have a problem with standards where it's very funny how the EU always talks about free trade. And when you look into the details, there's a lot of technical barriers to trade and there's a lot of standards. There's a lot of norms which actually make it difficult for companies, small companies to export to the EU. So here in this case, that's what India is likely to ask for more rice, sugar and grains exports to the EU. Whether it's going to get it, it's a different question because it will all depend also on, on the standards. Um, also textiles, as you were saying, Rania, India is likely to ask for more textile exports to the EU, and this will also have an impact in terms of jobs uh, in the EU in the textile sector. Um, there was an impact assessment uh, in 2009, and there, the, there was a, a slight decline in, in the sectors in the EU, in mostly apparel and leather. And again, here, the idea is not to have a competition between EU jobs and Indian jobs. The idea is what kind of jobs are we talking about? So increasing uh, the leather production, the apparel production in India for exports to, do it, to the EU, who does it benefit? Are we talking about big business that actually really badly employs women in a very precarious way? Or are we talking about small and medium enterprise, which can actually give a decent job to their workers? So that's that's... For the moment, what we're likely to see is mostly big companies that will actually export more to the EU, but will not pay better their employees. So it has a, a this is a, a problem for India. Unfortunately, there's not much that I can tell you. As Rania was saying, um, we have a lot of information because there's the EU has a lot of textual proposals online. Yes, so the EU shows. The documents, the first documents that they put on the table with India, we have them online, but this is not the end result of the agreement. We don't know exactly what is really being negotiated. There's still a lot that we do not know. And there are parallel discussions happening where there is no transparency at all. So the Trade and Technology Council between India and the EU is going to be set up where you'll see politicians and trade negotiators regularly meeting. This is already happening between the EU and the US, and we have no idea what, what's going on, but we know that business, big business. So here I'm quoting Business Europe, which is the main lobby organization for the biggest companies operating in the EU. And to them, this is a way to get political input into technical work. So there are also parallel political discussions that are not being that are not transparent at all, and that will have a significant impact on on the trade deal. So, what kind of demands should civil society raise in those negotiations? Well, I think as Rania was saying. Um, the EU is really talking a lot about greening its trade deal. It talks a lot about a chapter on trade and sustainable development. And the whole idea would be that if you had a strong chapter on sustainable development, you would have a lesser impact of the trade deals on, on people and the planet. The thing is, trade and sustainable development chapters, they do not change the patterns of trade. So if we have more and more exports of milk from the EU to the India, or if we have... Um, uh, yeah, more textile being sent to the EU. Those are things that are not being changed by the trade and sustainable development chapters. And all Train negotiators have a mandate to open up markets for EU companies in India. Indian train negotiators have a mandate to open up markets for Indian big business, mostly. And unless this doesn't change, you can have any annexes you want and any trade and sustainable chapters you want. You won't change the core objective of this deal. And that's why what you need, we need to ask is not this kind of trade deal. We need a deal, maybe, but if we need it, it's in the spirit of cooperation and solidarity, not in an idea that it's only about offensive and defensive interests. Um, I mean, yeah, you have the link for the report. Uh, you can contact me always and I'll, um, yeah, looking forward to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, 
also for uh, mentioning what can be done by civil society to uh, critically uh, assess these kind of agreements and uh, to again also mention what also um, Ranja said that uh, sustainable chapters are not changing the patterns of trade which are um, having um, often very negative effects on especially small-scale uh, traders or producers. Um, I had a very short drop out during Laura's uh, uh, presentation about 10, 20 seconds, but probably I was the only one um, because I didn't hear from anyone else. <laughs> so let's hope no, I, I was- I didn't hear either. I mean, I think she, she dropped off. I didn't hear also for a few seconds. Okay, but it was anyway very short, so I guess uh, we got uh, uh, everything that was uh, of most importance from her presentation. Um, now we will go ahead with uh, Dr. Biswajit Da. Um, he is former professor at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning in Juwahula Nauru University, New Delhi. The second time I hope I got the name of the university <laughs> right. <laughs> Before joining the university, he was Director General of Research and Information System for Development Countries, a think tank of the Ministry of External Affairs. He was instrumental in the establishment of the Center for WTO Studies of the Government of India, and he was head of the center for several years. He had also served as, the, as a senior consultant in the Planning Commission of India. He had served as member of the Indian delegation in multi multilateral treaty negotiations, including the World Trade Organization, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. He has been nominated in expert groups for several intergovernmental organizations. That's a very impressive list, so I'm very pleased to have you here, Biswat Chitar. Welcome. No. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. As we said before, um, we would like to know a bit more from you about what India's interest in current uh, uh, trade politics are, which role does the EU-India FTA play in these? But also since uh, Chachati Ghosh had to cancel recently, we would be very pleased and we asked uh, is watch it uh, on a short notice to also elaborate a bit more on a broader view on India's economic development and where it stands. So uh, take your time, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and participating in this very interesting discussion. Um, um, as my change to, uh, you know, from giving uh, a more focused assessment of the proposals uh, that are on the table from the European Union side, because we still don't know anything about what the government of India is thinking about uh, these uh, negotiations. Uh, so we are really, um, you know, in complete darkness about what India, Indian government stand would be. But uh, many of us who have dealt with these uh, negotiations, these F FTAs earlier, we have a we have some idea as to which way these, uh, 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 you know, India's uh, uh, positions would go. And some of that was reflected in um, uh, Ranja's presentation uh, when, when she talked about uh, all the concerns uh, uh, from, from different sections of uh, uh, the, the, the stakeholders. So uh, really, you know, that is something that at the end of the day, the government may actually reflect on that. And, and, and take a take a, a, a position based on uh, the concerns that uh, uh, Ranja had expressed. Now, let me give you a brief background as to how uh, we came uh, to begin um, uh, the, 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 the EU, uh, India FTA and many other FTAs that are uh, currently being negotiated. It's, it's also important to un, un, understand, uh, you know, why we started doing this because uh, immediately prior to commencing or recommencing the negotiations, uh, India had actually taken an isolationist position. You know, the 
in the, in the, in the, uh, the context of the COVID pandemic, uh, the government had announced the policy of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Hindi is Atma Nirbhar Bharat, and the, and the in English translation is self-reliance. Self of course, many in people, you know, people in the government or close to the government have vehemently argued that uh, this is not the interpretation of uh, what what Atma Nirbhar Bharat or self reliance. You know, they don't want to sort of uh, give that kind of an inter interpretation. But um, uh, 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 but but the reality is that India became inward looking, uh, 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 and this started even before the the COVID, COVID pandemic. Kind of a downturn uh, since uh, 2018, and uh, there have been a lot of demands by different industry groups, especially the larger industries uh, like, for instance, uh, textiles and clothing, a range of other manufacturing sectors, to raise tariffs on on manufacturing uh, uh, on on manufacturing imports. So, so uh, it was a very interesting kind of a, a phase because. Uh, almost more than one and a half decades prior to that, the Indian uh, in India, you know, tariffs on manufacturing products had been consistently coming down, and uh, uh, you know, and and suddenly there was a not only there was a uh, there were not only were breaks applied at that point, there was a reversal of uh, of the entire protectionist policies. So our average tariffs went out, uh, went up. Especially uh, because of high, higher manufacturing tariffs in India, agricultural tariffs have already been high. They have always been high; they remain high. And um, the important, uh, uh, you know, since I'm talking about tariffs at this point, let me also mention India. Great major instru instruments of policy still remains tariffs. Uh, now this is very unlike many of the other trade partners of India, uh, where tariffs have almost become passe, uh, and you know the trade barriers have moved elsewhere. Uh, you know we have uh, we are now seeing the emergence of a lot of these non-tariff measures, standards, and other things that uh, Ranja was talking about. But India is still uh, heavily dependent on tariffs. Uh, uh, so uh, so have, given this given this kind of a stance, why did uh, you know, India uh, began negotiating. Um, uh, uh, there were about eight FTAs that were listed by the government in December 21. Uh, and um, so there was, uh, you know, from starting from Australia, India FTA to the European, uh, to the United Arab Emirates, a whole lot of others. Now, um, my understanding is that this was a period where, uh, you know, this was post uh, the COVID, uh, and thanks to all the all the stimulus that were given give, given by the advance, uh, India's exports started. Significantly, and in our uh, financial year 21-22, our exports reached a record level of of more than 400 billion dollars. Uh, now, now exports, Indian exports have been well below 400 billion. They've been struggling to reach 350 billion dollars, and suddenly, you know, we have a an increase of almost 100 billion dollars in in one year, uh, in 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 one financial year. So, uh, it's, it's uh, natural to expect the government to be extremely upbeat and very confident that you know, having got a huge market access in that period, the government, I think, was confident that you know we can do these trade deals and then use whatever they thought was the power of indian industry and also agricultural exports went up that this was the time to strike big and and started doing uh, you know sort of engaging uh, in these trade negotiations including that with the european union so so that that's br uh, briefly the background why india sort of changed uh, its stance. Like, like I, I mentioned, that it's not as if the uh, India's protectionism, that the protectionist tendencies that India had shown all, 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 uh, all through, and that was in significant sectors, which uh, Ranja also mentioned, 
on an engaged of agriculture, small uh, uh, industry. So that remained. So it's not as if we just went, uh, became, uh, 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 you know, very liberal and uh, because of the, the exports going up. So, uh, uh, so the question is that uh, did the, the red lines which were there in 2013, when the negotiations had come to, uh, uh, had, had been suspended in 2013, the EU-India FTAs, did the red lines also disappear? Now, uh, from what I'm just saying that, the, uh, that our, uh, our um, uh, 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 protectionism really didn't come down, it actually went up. And, and therefore, uh, you can actually see that the red lines really didn't move. And the major sectors which were opposed to doing this deal in, in 2013 and, 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 and prior to that. Now, given tariffs in those sectors haven't come down, it'd be very difficult for them, for these sectors to come on board. And these are major sectors. And one of them is, uh, is automobiles. Now, automobiles, you know, as the uh, 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 European Union has major interest in automobiles, they would like uh, the companies, uh, the European companies would like to do uh, business in this expanding Indian market. Uh, whether the Indian companies are going to blink, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so, because, uh, 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 you know, in, and another thing that has happened uh, in, in, uh, since these negotiations have begun, is that there hasn't been a, uh, a significant amount of uh, discussion about these FTAs in public domain. Uh, I think uh, both in terms of the civil society engagement and in terms of the industries coming out and expressing their views on, uh, on this FTA, we haven't actually heard, heard uh, anything. Uh, but I guess that uh, when push comes to shove, the industry is, is going to say something about it and they're not going to be accepting uh, this uh, very uh, very easily. So the larger picture as far as India is concerned uh, remains uh, pretty much unchanged. Uh, and this year, actually, we are also seeing, uh, 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 you know, coinciding with the, the global kind of, uh, you know, uh, slowing down of growth, we are also seeing a significant decrease in the rate of increase of, of, of our exports. So, uh, so uh, uh, I think what drove us to these uh, us to these negotiations, those reasons maybe uh, uh, may not be may not uh, uh, stand very much when the government comes to looking at these numbers uh, 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 this year. Let me come to some of the specifics now, and uh, in the terms of specifics. Uh, Ranja mentioned, I'm just going to elaborate on the points that she made, that in number of areas and, and where uh, the issues, uh, you know, the, 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 the issue at hand would be changing domestic legislation, uh, you know, uh, uh, as a part of the commitment it, uh, and the EU India uh, FTA commitment, this was basically mean multilateralization of multilateral, multilateralizing the, the bilateral commitments. So if, for instance, intellectual property law is part of the commitment, then of course, it's going to be multilateralized. And all the countries, uh, or all the, you know, the WTO members would be able to uh, take advantage of the changed laws that India offers in, in case of intellectual property, or for, for, for instance, agriculture, for instance, in, in, in case of investment. Now, again, I would like to echo uh, um, uh, Ranja's, uh, you know, concerns about intellectual property. Um, the two areas which have always been uh, very important for us, uh, agriculture, uh, where uh, India has uh, a distinct intellectual property law for protecting plant varieties, and where uh, we provide, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, farmers' rights. We recognize informal innovation by farmers, uh, and also uh, allow farmers to save seeds of one harvest into the next. Now, those provisions will be taken out if India joins UPA of ninety one, uh, and and that's going to be a serious matter. Uh, the second issue, again, uh, you know, sort of give, getting a little more specific on what uh, uh, in the in. Uh, 
model law uh, of for protection of uh, investments. There, there were substantive uh, changes from the earlier model law, and, and two of them are very significant. One is the definition of investment, and that's very different from a stand, standard template which the European Union is proposing. And uh, the ISDS, the, in, uh, the, uh, the Investor State Dispute Settlement uh, Mechanism, where uh, you know India provides a lot more space to domestic arbitration and then going to international arbitration. Now that is going to be a a, 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 a big issue. Now, um, uh, uh, labor and environment. I think they, these are going to be really the, the very the big the, the most important thing for for, for India. Labor, because labor standards, as proposed in the, uh, the, the 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 chapter on trade and sustainable development, uh, commits India to uh, to ratify all the uh, uh, core conventions of the International Labour Organization, which India hasn't done. And and the other thing that is happening today is that. Uh, you know, uh, for uh, for labor, which means that labor rights are not going to be as strong as they used to be earlier. Uh, so there is going to be a clash between what the government intends to to tone down labor rights and what you intends to strengthen labor rights in in, conf in conformity with the uh, the um, uh, ILO conventions. So I don't see how these this is going to be resolved. And on environment. Uh, so just one issue on climate change. India had already uh, mentioned in the in the Glasgow, uh, uh, you know, COP that we are we actually looking for a longer, uh, you know, phase in for uh, the uh, the the uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, confirming to the UNF uh, Triple C, uh, you know, the targets for um, uh, being uh, uh, carbon neutral. So, uh, so these these are these are going to be significant issues for India, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, finally, I would like to mention that um, the market again. This has been said, but I just want to be a little more specific on that. That India, in case of uh, of uh, whatever you offer, because like I mentioned, you you know doesn't have uh, a very high tariffs. Tariffs are rather low. So it, it, it would uh, look attractive uh, that uh, from an Indian perspective that market access is available. And like Ranja mentioned, that there are these standards which are waiting uh, to be, uh, you know, to be confronted. And one major uh, 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 issue that would that would arise here is is in the technical the chapter on technical barriers to trade. Uh, the, the there is an annex. In which the European Union has listed out several institutions uh, whose standards would have to be met as a part of these agreements. Now, I don't, I don't see, I, I don't, I don't know how many of the Indian um, industries have actually looked at this list. I was talking to a friend from the automobile industry. He had, he didn't know that uh, this agreement requires India, Indian, 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 Indian industry. To accept uh, 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 an automobile industry norm that is called WP29, World Forum for Harmonization. Now, India has been negotiating, but we are still not. So there are. Uh, so European Union has made it very clear that they have all these uh, standards, all these institutions will have to be met. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, market access is going to be uh, uh, going to be uh, um, uh, pretty difficult. And, um, and 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 last but not the least, uh, India's main uh, 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 you know I think the the um, uh, uh, offensive interest is in services, and in services it it is especially more for which Laura was mentioning uh, that you know there are there would be concerns in the European Union if European Union is uh, uh, accepts India's uh, demands. For greater access to uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, you know um, service providers from India on, under mode four, so uh, um, all in all, it, this looks uh, um, uh, pretty daunting for India. Uh, and 
their concerns of getting, giving market access to the European Union and uh, getting market access uh, 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 into the European Union is going to be pretty daunting. So mention, I mean, has, hasn't, doesn't have great record in taking the free trade agreements in the past. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns in India about utilizing the FTAs, the preferential access uh, provided by ASEAN in uh, Japan and Korea. And uh, there is a lot of skepticism already. Now, how this skepticism uh, uh, shows up in course of these negotiations, one has, one will have to see. But of course, uh, the, the, the road uh, doesn't look uh, uh, very easy. It looks uh, uh, quite, quite rocky. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Biswajit, uh, for this very thorough presentation and also looking deeper into the history of the negotiations and putting them in context with the with the other policies. Um, that was very enlightening. There had been also some short uh, hiccups uh, in in your in your how you say <laughs> internet connection. That's right. Um, I. I had the impression that we didn't really miss anything important, um, but if someone didn't understand something, um, he may or she may put it in the in the Q and A box. Sure, sure, sure. Um, thank you so much. Also, thank you again for mentioning that uh, tariffs, which are classic instruments of trade policies, are still relevant in in parts of the world it's not only india i guess we when we talk about what i mentioned before mercosur there's also still some sectors which have very uh, uh, elevated uh, tariffs to protect their 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 uh, regional or national industries um but uh we can of course go deeper into that uh, later now i would like to uh welcome very much our uh fourth uh speaker helmut scholz um he is member of the european parliament since 2009 and there is member of the german delegation of the left group and he is amongst many other roles of course also member of the committee on international trade inter welcome very much helmut um I would like to know from you um, what the demands of the left are in the European Parliament toward the EU-India trade deal, and also what, in your point of view, are the, the intentions of the European Union. Um, and of course, feel free to mention other topics that you would like to have discussed and uh, address what the others said. Um, the floor is yours, Helmut. Thank you, Florian, and thank you all for having invited me to join um, <clears throat> this very um, in time, I would say, a webinar. Uh, so um, good afternoon in Europe and good evening, maybe already in India, uh, to our distinguished friends and colleagues over there. Uh, this timely event takes place just on the eve of the fourth round of the negotiations for a comprehensive free trade agreement. And uh, so I think it is good to have in this momentum this uh, exchange of views concerning what, what are our experience until now and what has to be done in the next um, phase of the accompanying the negotiations. Uh, so I have been invited to share uh, certain points of my analysis of the intentions of the European Union, in particular of the left group in the European Parliament, or what is not the European Union but it's just one of the political actors uh, in the parliament who is, of course, also in responsibility to, to deal with the, with the negotiations, with the outcome of the negotiations and with further perspectives. So uh, the size of India's market, market uh, with this enormous um, population of 1.4 billion people has always created a certain appetite, as I would say, uh, for businesses in the European Union to have access to this market. Um, but that is the same for the United States, that's the same for the Russian Federation, that's the same for China and other uh, countries. 
So with its ability to offer quite a huge market uh, to the Indian businesses as well, the EU succeeded uh, in 2007 to invite India to sit together at the negotiation table um, for a formal free and uh, formal free trade agreement. This is direct for some years, but until the suspension of the negotiations in 2013 for lack, lack of ambition, probably from both sides. Uh, what we now see is formally um, not the new negotiations, which I really regret, but the relaunch, the, the relaunch of the old talks with an old mandate. And that is important to understand because it means that the negotiators from the European Union side, so the GG trade, the commission, operate on behalf of the council, so on behalf of all 27 member states' governments. Um, uh, this old 16-year-old uh, mandate. And that is already my, my first and maybe biggest criticism. We must knowledge, take knowledge of the year 2023 and not of 2007. So the, the, the economic development in the world and the, the challenges have um, <clears throat> rapidly changed a lot. And with a deep impact into the realities of the livelihood of the citizens, uh, of course, in the European Union, but probably also very true for the Indian population or for other um, um, people in, in, in other countries in the world and other continents. So the reason so why the negotiations probably have relaunched are linked to the, to the question how we get access mutually to markets, but they have also relaunched in the decision of the political leaders in 21 are geopolitical interests. And this change, geopolitical and also geoeconomic situation has led on both sides to the readiness to relaunch the, 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 the negotiation. That, that we have to take into uh, into account that this is not only speaking about uh, old trade languages, it has to do with the reality how we are producing today in our societies, how we are consuming, what is our interest, in which way environmental, social, uh, political um, changes have an impact on the reality, and what does it mean for a um, relationship between also the European Union and India. Uh, and that ge uh, change geopolitical and geoeconomic situation is uh, facing an increasingly fierce competition with China. So the competition be between the US and China uh, uh, characterized by a systemic rivalry. Um, also the US is seeking with the European Union for allies. Uh, seeking for new partnerships with different countries and new strongholds also in the Indo-Pacific region. And the, uh, my understanding is that India saw on its side also opportunity to pursue its own interests and secure a better deal under these circumstances. The so Russia's attack on the Ukraine has now increased also the willingness of the European Union to speed up even the negotiations, aiming to conclude in record time uh, by the end of this year, these negotiations. If it is successful, if it will succeed, that's a different issue. But the intention that they are linking to these negotiations, we should take very seriously. Both sides want to bring into the harvest before the parliamentary elections scheduled for May 2024, this trade deal. As a left, we question the new Indo-Pacific uh, strategy of the European Union, instead of trying to talk uh, to other countries, uh, choosing to go against China, we should all come to our sense and cooperate on tackling the main threats of humankind. And I think this would be for the left, and that is for the left in the European Parliament, one of the, 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 the huge 
uh, bargaining chips, as I would say, if we are combining it or if we are transponding it in the trade language um, to, to tackle climate change, to, uh, uh, to uh, pandemic diseases, question of the loss of biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, also the question of peace and war. And we need to cooperate to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Seven years uh, left. I want to be very clear. What does it mean for us in the cooperation also between the EU and, 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 and India? This is very much about um, overcoming poverty on our planet. And we need to cooperate to end and prevent the wars and armed conflicts in our planet. However, this is not written in the old mandate for the European Union. For the EU, India FTA negotiations. Instead, the DG trade, as I've said already, is following a standard approach of neoliberal trade liberalization. They use standardized uh, templates for all the chapters to be negotiated. And you can find the text, as it was already mentioned by my um, predecessors in the debate. And I thank you very much for your in interesting uh, contributions and insights. Um, on, on the website of the Commission. This is a degree of transparency. And I think here we have also to say that this was achieved also by the struggle of a lot of NGOs, by the public, and also of a majority in the European Parliament to make trade negotiations more transparent as it has been in the past. And that was a success also of the, on the demonstrations on TTIP and CETA on the streets throughout uh, the member states of the European Union. Um, and other agreements concluded, uh, this meant to agree on zero tariffs, so this template, uh, for up to 98% of all goods traded, leaving room for just few, very few, or um, some um, exemptions for the most sensitive products from the um, negotiating uh, partners. Mostly and that is in particular interesting for India uh, in the agriculture sector. Furthermore, the EU will aim to gain full access to India's attractive market for services uh, offered by EU companies, in particular the financial services. That is also a very important issue and Europe's large retail companies would love, I would stress, to be finally able to operate their large supermarkets and warehouse in India. The negotiations are also about defining the rules for this new trade relationship. This concerns quality conditions. This concerns, uh, for example, the observation of Europe sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Secondly, it is about intellectual property rights, what already stressed also in the was stressed in the debate today. Uh, and Europe's large pharma. Uh, corporations demand an end to India's shorter periods of patent protection than it is agreed in other agreements uh, worldwide. To gain to India's uh, medical generator sector, which reduces the profits of those corporations who once paid for the research. Stressing that, I would say that me as a left, in the European Union want to stress the importance of having the subcontinent in a fair and solidary cooperation linkage to tackle the global challenges of today and tomorrow, in particular in this direction. So let us take the issue, for example, of health. And the Conference on the Future of Europe in the European Union has stressed that citizens want to have a health union and so let us take this experience and to see how and which, what is India's role as a pharmacy of the world offering affordable um, and thus accessible medications to the poorer part of the population in all our countries as well. We strongly warn therefore against negotiating that model away for the sake of free trade and liberalizing only. At the same time, the left has to get a certain um, stand of also a certain understanding of the complexities of IPRs, the rules and standards, how they are worked out, how they are set and fixed, and the question how to make them operable 
uh, for a necessary cooperation in the field of R&D, uh, access to technologies, etc. We also think that in general, it's a mistake of the commission to treat India like any other partner in such FTA negotiations. For decades, India has followed its very own approach in its economic and regulatory policies that I want to stress and that it would be a sort of shock, shock ter uh, therapy um, um, when, when overnight it had to be adapted to the EU's policy approaches and our experience and our way of how we are producing certain goods and services. Um, though there are no big supermarkets in India, in, in contrary to Europe, it is not the retailers who define uh, the price the farmers can achieve for the products, in particular India's way of organizing its dairy production and redistribution through cooperatives would be at high risk if here we would have an, a negative impact of the negotiations and we have to be very careful. Personally, I would also rather see such cooperatives to be formed in Europe and the rest of the world as well. So why not to take the Indian example as a new benchmark, as a new standard uh, we have to introduce? That is then opening the question how to go there and do we have the chance to find international structures and organizations which are able to discuss such questions in a productive and cooperative way. I recommend refu ref to refocus uh, the negotiations. Let us identify, for example, what we need to do for the positive uh, developments of our societies. I mentioned already the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I guess, and I, I always strive for that in my parliamentarian work, to make them a good guideline and as well to offer also other useful benchmarks to measure our success. Let us sign, for example, not speak anymore about the free trade agreement alone, but this free trade agreement must be changed into an agreement of fair exchange um, and of cooperation. Um, and um, so that can then have trade related elements but it should be based on the principles of fair trade. It should be print, uh, based on, on, on the understanding not to maximizing profits. And I must say that the new model chapter of the EU on trade and sustainable development contains already some good or many good aspects for our future cooperation. And here I would really dispute a little bit with Laura uh, Fedek, because I think if we put such TSD chapters in the core of the negotiations, then of course we have to find approaches. What does it mean to have a fair and cooperative uh, um, uh, relationship? What does it mean for, for workers? What does it mean for farmers to live in dignity and, and, and to have dig, uh, um, uh, jobs in dignity, enabling them to, to create circular economies, etc. So, I mean, I only want to, to give a certain understanding why we are welcoming that TSD chapters could be an option. And uh, India's resistance in the WTO to link trade to other issues like climate change, to poverty questions, to, uh, to, to gender issues, etc., which is under the discussion under the reforming of the WTO, I think it would be a missed opportunity for the left on both sides in India, as well as in the European Union, not to use this chance here to, to change the whole attitude and to go away from the only maximizing profits understanding of a neoliberal free trade um, relationship. So um, indeed, also this TSD chapter here, I agree, is lacking commitments for financial support and suggestion for accompanying measures. So finally, on the geopolitical aspect, one remark, I assume that it would be a mistake to sign an EU deal without rethinking the way, what does it mean for other free trade agreements or agreements or investment agreements already concluded? 
So the whole question of the RCAP, the uh, CTPCP, and of course also the, um, the CHI agreement between the European Union and China, um, because they have to, that has to be uh, understood in the complexity. And um, I hope that uh, also India is looking into this challenge because from my point of view, India has no interest in further deterioration of its relation with its neighbor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helmut, for this uh, presentation um, and also for keeping within the times more or less we, we uh, gave. So we have now a lot of time for discussion. Um, I was uh, looking into all the questions that has been posed already. Um, and since, uh, well, since Helmut also brought the important dimension of the geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, context, I was looking into starting with that. But then he came <laughs> again with the TSD question. And I guess we should in this uh, respect give the opportunity to the others to answer if they would like, because I think it was not only Laura who mentioned this, but also Ranja had in a way something to say about um, how trade and sustainable development chapters may or not be uh, helpful in this context. And also, if I understood uh, this watch it right, when he talked about the heavy conflict that may be appearing about workers' rights, then maybe he has also something to say to that. So I would probably give first the word to Ranja, because uh, it's the longest time she didn't speak of all of us. <laughs> and then we go ahead with Laura and Biswachi on the TSD, if you want to say something about that. Uh, yeah, of course, I want to. And I appreciate the point made by Mr. Scholz that, I mean, we talked about this in Delhi also, right? That uh, uh, that could these new trade these trade agreements be used to address these modern challenges of today now my uh, i mean the, the point that i was raising uh, i mean with respect to this is we do see these lot of uh, discussions on trade and environment trade and sustainability coming into the wto uh, and eu is a major kind of promoter of that framework right in the WTO and also in the FTAs we are also seeing it coming in the IPEF the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework with the US uh, the, the challenge is and I think there were questions also whether for example the sustainable development chapter can address the gender issues that can it protect you know uh, what would be the impact on women and Dalits in India and could it uh, promote their labor rights I think for example, if you look at the sustainable development chapter on gender, it talks about uh, implementing the SDG goal five. It talks about equal you know, economic rights of men and women. So for example, no wage uh, disparity between men and women and so on. But firstly, it's a cooperation model. And as I said, you know, there are substantive provisions in other chapters which are not overturned by that chapter. That chapter remains that way. Uh, what I would say is basically double speak because, uh, for example, I mean, as I said, like women farmers, you know, would be strongly kind of uh, hurt by this agreement because EU has major offensive interest in agriculture. They gave high subsidies. They have high standards. So without reciprocal access, we do expect European agricultural products to come in you know, flood the Indian market. And therefore, the small farmers who do not have credit, who do not have, you know, like any kind of support system, and women farmers will be among them, they will be hurt. So we have small woman, women um, dairy, you know, as I said, milk producers, for example, Amul, our cooperative, and we have this very strong cooperative model in our dairy sector. And most of their milk suppliers are very small women. Uh, dairy farmers. They have one cow at home, they use some milk at home, and the rest they sell. 
the problem is on paper there is no discrimination against women right and there is not so these uh, but but they will be hit by this FTA. So women have, for example, less lower access to healthcare services, to medicines. For example, you know, I was talking to HIV infected couples in India and the woman, they give up treatment if there's any kind of, if they don't get the medicines and if both the, both the husband and wife are infected, they give up treatment because the husband is the breadwinner. So his treatment must go on. And if you stop, you know, HIV treatment, then you go back to zero. You're fully exposed uh, to kind of to these risks. But the problem is, again, this is not a gender discrimination written on paper. This is not something which our sustainable chapter development chapter can address. But at the same time, the, the other provisions in this FTA, which raises, you know, intellectual property rights standards, which is expected to even further increase the cost of medicines, which is expected to, you know, actually create challenges for small uh, women fishers or women dairy farmers or women agricultural farmers and, and take away, for example, their preferential treatment in government procurement. These are not being addressed. If you talk about sustainability issue, EU on the one hand has its, you know, raw material initiative. It's very clear that it wants to use the FTAs to extract raw material and natural resources from developing countries. And they use the investment chapter and the export taxes. They do not want us to Im impose any export taxes. They use it to export extract raw material but at the same time they are talking about sustainability which means we the way they are talking about sustainability is we cannot develop our own renewable energy projects you know so there is a and they will never address the isds the eu has suggested either exceed uncitral uh, arbitration or now use own multilateral investment court which which does not address the problems with the isds so what i'm saying is there are substantive provisions which would be working against environmental conservation, against labor rights, against women's rights. But these tokenistic chapters on so-called sustainable development will not address it. Sorry, my, my uh, response became a bit long. So I think we have to really think much more innovatively. We have to think uh, really how, whether these could at all work, frankly, in trade agreements. Yeah, I'll end here. Thank you, Ranja. Um, Laura, would you have something to add also to the subject? Yes, please. I, I can see it's a passionate subject and I'd, I'd love to uh, spend uh, an entire debate on this, but uh, to be short. Uh, so I think there's, like, I could totally agree um, uh, with Ranja. I will just add the fact that, so the EU is proposing a trade and sustainable development chapter in which there could be sanctions where disputes could be... Um, made and it's using a case where the EU has had a dispute on the trade year, on the labor and the EU always says oh you see thanks to a trade agreement and our beautiful chapter we got this labor improvement in Korea but I invite you to read an article in bilaterals from a trade union leader in Korea and the improvements in the labor conditions came from the labor movement in Korea not from the trade deal. And also there has been a case in Guatemala, between Guatemala and the USA based on the trade deal for labor rights and they, they, they lost. So they tried to improve labor rights through a trade deal in Guatemala and it didn't work out because the dispute was about trade and the, the jury said, no, there's no labor violation. Um, when there are some strong TSD chapters and there are some disputes, they, they no. don't really make a difference, the, the trade, the sustainable development chapters. Ah, did it cut? If you take the example of milk, we'll be sending milk from the EU to India. And whether we have the Paris Agreement in the TSD chapter will not change the fact that we'll be the, our milk will travel so many miles when both the EU and the India are know really well how to make their own milk. So I think we should keep saying no. I think, of course, the EU has, there was a lot of opposition to trade deals. So now the commission has this TSD chapter, but it's because we said no that we have those TSD chapters. So I think we shouldn't stop saying no. We should say, okay, maybe you're improving, but it's still very far away from the kind of deal that we need for the people and the planet. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, and now, Biswajit, what's your take on this? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's nice to see Halmut again and uh, uh, after a meeting in Delhi. Um, no, I, I think I'll uh, like to start uh, from uh, what Helmut said about changing the, the framework altogether. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the framework that we are talking about in the, in the, free, in this, in the free trade agreement is, is, is all about uh, providing market access to the big business. Yeah? And all this is something recognized multilateral trade uh, another you know, trade trade framework that trade is supposed to be a, a handmaiden of development now uh, anyone who's actually done any work on the WTO would know from the, the preamble uh, you know the uh, uh, the paragraph of the Marrakesh agreement which said very clearly that trade is supposed to be a, a means to an end of providing jobs to providing you know sort of reducing inequalities and um, and and what have you so the the point is that uh, you know uh, when uh, we have uh, increasing challenges that countries are facing uh, uh, in 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 terms of their own development uh, do we need an agreement which only looks at uh, 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 you know um, excluding very large sections of the society you know in the in the sustainable development goals and many are many other uh, uh, you know pronouncements at, at the global level uh, there is a lot of language about inclusive growth uh, but when you look at the large section of of the uh, of, of the of the society of a society that we're talking about uh, in all the discussions that we had today, we are only talking about how the uh, the different chapters are going to be to, going to make uh, uh, the, uh, the the conditions more difficult for the working people, for the for the farmers, for the women, for you know the the small businesses. Uh, now, now, surely these people are, form the majority of uh, population uh, in in India, and of course they would also be substantial number of people in Europe, Europe as well, who, who face development, de development challenges. So, so I would actually echo, echo what uh, um, uh, Helmut was saying that, you know, the, the, the entire framework needs to be changed. Uh, uh, you need a framework of co cooperation where uh, you, 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 the markers don't have to be market access. The mar markers don't have to be increased market access in each other's countries. But then the marker should be food security, for instance, um, health security, uh, as to recognizing uh, women's rights, ensuring that they are not disempowered uh, uh, even more from wherever they are, and and steps are taken to improve the the, the, the conditions of the marginalized section, sections of the society. So, so for me, you know, and the intellectual property uh, chapter or whatever we are looking at the intellect in, the, in terms of intellectual property protection, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the first and the foremost thing would be to ensure that access to medicines is ensured at affordable prices. And this was one of the issues that uh, the Indian Civil Society had raised in 2006, you know, the, immediately after those... Uh, the decision was taken uh, uh, to uh, launch the negotiations when, and we knew what was coming. Uh, and after 2007, of course, we got together. And I think it was in 2008 or 2009, I'm forgetting, and my memory uh, fails me now, that there was a resolution in the European Parliament saying that uh, India's concerns about uh, access to medicines at affordable prices, that would, that would be respected. Uh, and, and whatever comes out of the trade deal, uh, In, in terms of the patent law, which provides this space to, uh, uh, you know, for uh, ensuring uh, affordable medicines, that is that is that is there. So I think what we need to do is to really, you know, shift the whole the entire you know the goalposts. 
uh, India and, and, and uh, 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 European um, uh, Union need to need to collaborate and and uh, to make um, uh, you know the situations the, the conditions in the peoples are in our two countries better from what they are um, uh, ensure that you know the the sustainable development goals don't become like the millennium development goals that were that were earlier uh, you know uh, put put down for the developing countries and the sustainable development goals at the end of, end of seven the seven years and in, in 2030 we see that there's been a substantial improvement towards realizing some of those uh, targets that have been put in the sustainable development goals now i don't see how uh, the the current uh, the framework you know the, the current model of uh, of uh, uh, of economic management uh, uh, a retrogression for from uh, what is what is already there so i would say that the the, the current uh, uh, model uh, of uh, economic uh, uh, management that changes from you know looking at you know uh, just the markets to uh, uh, considering the conditions of uh, 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 the people and improving their conditions now uh, that needs to be a project project you know, that needs to be uh, you know meeting of the minds uh, from from two sides and uh, uh, to give an alternative because the more we discuss this these kinds of frameworks uh, the more we are actually uh, be trying to just uh, do uh, what I, what i call uh, uh, damage limitation we would say that you know we are coming at cutting at the corners and saying that look you know this is something that doesn't look good let us not do this let us try and make uh, make it a little more palatable uh, but at the end of the day uh, you know these kinds of minor fixes will not uh, really uh, uh, provide much uh, uh, much in terms of uh, where, where we what, where we want to go, and this is something that Helmut mentioned very uh, uh, succinctly. Actually, that this is the framework that. So, so really, we need a we need an alternative framework, and uh, uh, you know, the the entire uh, like I said, the goalposts need to change, and uh, and we need to work from there. We work, work, need to work backwards from a different set of goals. Of cooperation between the two countries and see how this, this these uh, you know the agreements between the two countries, cooperation between the two countries takes um, the two countries closer to what their peoples actually expect aspire, rather than just the big businesses what they aspire. So that is a very important uh, uh, task that is uh, before us. Now, uh, that's the larger picture. I think we can, again, talk uh, endlessly about it, but surely uh, uh, we need, need a framework. And uh, this is the time to actually start uh, looking at a different framework, the, the framework that Helmut uh, started talking about and what I was just trying to uh, talk on the top of my head. Uh, this is something that is uh, urgently required. There was a question I just wanted to respond in the... In the, in the uh, Now yes, we pro no. Can you hear me? There had been some dropouts again. Uh, try again. Um, if not, you may try to switch off your camera so we can. Oh, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Can can it, can, is it does it uh, does it sound better? Can we I... can we can hear you. Okay. No, what I said, you know, I have a very short short point. Uh, finally, I said that we need to change the goalposts, and then we need to work backwards to see how we can meet. Those back those those goalposts, uh, and uh, what we need to do in terms of increasing our uh, you know increasing the cooperation between the two countries, uh, we are really talking about uh, inclusive development. We are really talking about uh, uh, stopping this empowerment of the marginalized sections of uh, our society, and uh, we don't want uh, um, another sort of uh, structure coming on top of whatever is already there to make things uh, even worse. So, so that, that is what my short point is. And, and, and my appeal uh, to all, all uh, uh, concerned would be that uh, let us start working on this kind of a framework. Uh, uh, and governments and, and the parliaments that this is what is, what is required to be done. 
and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, RLS can can uh, can can uh, uh, you know uh, can support and uh, facilitate this kind of work. I just wanted to respond to uh, a, a couple of questions. One particular question on the geopolitical uh, uh, you know uh, dimension of uh, these this, these negotiations. Now, certainly there is a geopolitical dimension and it actually reinforces uh, what uh, uh, the commitment of uh, the government uh, to, to do this trade deal. And um, India is actually doing a uh, very careful uh, balancing act uh, between its, uh, you know, sort of longstanding uh, closeness with the, uh, with the Russians and uh, this, the, the closeness uh, actually transcends many levels, just not the economic level, but also strategic support that uh, the, you know, the government or India has been receiving for, for, for decades. And that is being balanced by, you know, uh, close with, uh, uh, certainly there is, there is a very, very important uh, uh, dimension there. Uh, and um, it's, it's again very important to look beyond these kinds of uh, 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 the, the conflict situation that we are seeing. And then again, uh, the civil society needs to think through and find what can be done in order to end this kind of uh, the conflict that is there. Both, all sides need, need to talk to each other and find uh, a, a, a way out. It's not, and my, my firm opinion is that it's not just the governments which can actually do this. Um, there, there needs to be a very active involvement by the civil society, uh, uh, very strong uh, involvement uh, by the, the, the parliament in, in, the, in the country's concern uh, and, and to come up with uh, uh, some kind of a, a way forward. So I, I thought that, you know, I'll try and uh, suggest uh, what I think is extremely important in the larger context. And uh, these are the steps that uh, we, we, we could take uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, now, please, uh, Helmut, please allow me to take again uh, Ranja um, and Laura before you have the chance to to say, uh, to respond again to what has been said, um, because there have been some very specific questions, which I would like to, to ask now, and then we can go back into the bigger debate we had. Um, so I would like, oh, so, uh, some of the listeners would like to know from you, Ranja, um, um, how the agreement could impact women and uh, Dalits and of what could be included in this, uh, no, that's a bit the same, what could be included in the sustainability chapter to promote the labor rights? Well, we said some of this already, but if you have something to Ed, and then there was the question about the small scale farmers. Um, uh, someone wanted to know how many farmers would be affected by this. Um, if you could just answer these questions quickly. Um, thank you very much. Uh, on the gender issue, I think I kind of already explained that women who are, you know, like who, especially women from poor households, which would include Dalits and rural women households, uh, you know, uh, rural women and uh, even uh, women in poor urban households, they already have limited access, say, to medicines, right? And then in, we have a preponderance of women farmers among small farmers. Women farmers are generally small farmers. They are also, as I said, like small milk producers. So we do expect adverse impact because I think this agreement, as I was saying at the beginning, it would be an inequalizing agreement. It makes... The more, even in my country, it would make the more powerful, the big business may be richer, but the smaller producers, you know, women and marginal, marginalized constituencies will have less access to services, resources, and so on. And as I said, the gender chapter, I mean, the gender part of the sustainable development chapter does not, it has some language on meeting SDGs, etc., but it actually does not address the challenges which would come from other parts of the agreement. The substantive provisions on agriculture, which will make European 
you know, agribusiness enter Indian markets and displace Indian small farmers and so on. So these kind of issues, they are not seen as gender issues, right? So these cannot be addressed through the gender chapter in any case. And the gender chapter in any case is kind of more, um, uh, uh, in a way, uh, more uh, lip service. It doesn't really go deep into the problems and it doesn't take on the substantive uh, challenges, I think. That's one. And I think, uh, yeah, about small scale farmers, I mean, 93 million farmers uh, is what we have and uh, around 80% of them are small farmers. Now, I'm not saying that all will be affected, right? But we do expect a major threat because under the circumstances, it's the small farmers which will get pushed out. If you're not, you know, upper, if you are large scale, you still may be able to survive a little bit and the small farmers especially don't have access to credit their access to even land is at threat even from you know the investment provisions and access to they cannot even afford seeds and fertilizers you know like every every uh, when they cultivate so they are already in a very precarious condition we are having massive farmers suicides actually i mean there are farmer groups present here who could tell you so i mean these are the but and so therefore uh, of small farmers, we do expect uh, not all, but a huge uh, lot of them. So say you, we are talking about 70 million farmers, but we are. I'm not saying that all 70 million farmers would be wiped out, but we do expect a massive uh, challenge there. And dairy, if you talk about 8 million uh, farmers, dairy farmers. And, and, the, and there was a question that, what, what I mean, I think maybe that's for Laura, but how, what does the European Commission reply when we talk about small scale agriculture? See, they are never going to say they are against. They are not in principle on paper against small scale agriculture, right? It is the, what they, they are demanding will in effect wipe out small scale agriculture in India. That is the that's the concern. Thank yeah. you, Ranja. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, Laura. Um, there had been someone asking question about to go more into depth into the data exchange issue um, because of the new data privacy law, which is, has obviously brought into effect in India. So if you could do that. Um, but also there had been quest a question about the EU due diligence law, which is supposed to come in effect and what this could have uh, uh what could this mean for the eu india fta um and yes there was also the question about what the european commission says uh, when ngos point out the small scale the 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 focus on small scale agriculture contrary to big agricultural business laura okay perfect um i'll start with data privacy so the way it works, it's um, it's not part of the free trade agreement in itself. Is the EU that officially recognizes the Indian data privacy laws as equivalent or adequate? It's an adequacy decision. So the EU state. We're also use, uh, losing you again, Laura. Probably you may also try to turn off your camera while you speak. Can you hear me? Probably that's not the case. The objective enough. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I think I'm not the only one who completely lost you for the last minute. Um, let's try again. Um, okay. Um, so I was talking about the way it works as an adequacy law. Okay, I'm going to have a look if, if I'm going to say anything. Okay. So the EU reckon, has what it calls, calls an adequacy decision. So it's not part of the free trade agreement in itself, but it has a separate decision saying this country has different laws, but we believe that they protect citizens and data privacy the same way. So they enact an adequacy decision. Um, this has been done, for instance, while there were negotiations between the EU and the US, and there was an agreement that the US had different data privacy legislation, but it was uh, the same level of ambition and, and privacy data privacy protection. This has been challenged in the EU Court of Justice a few times. And the idea was that, and now the law in India has changed, but there were lots of... Um, 
I mean, the, the trade negotiators were quite positive that the EU would do the same kind of decision for India. So it would basically recognize Indian privacy laws as equivalent to EU privacy laws. This obviously is going to change now, considering the fact that the law doesn't cover government. So it allows government to keep having surveilling its citizens and the online actions of citizens. And this leads to a lot of human rights violations in India. So it's now more unlikely that the decision will be taken. Overall, there'll be a lot of push from businesses and from politicians to actually have this decision. Um, I think the EU will be scared also of, of any kind of trials and, and legal consequences of this due to the fact of what happened between the EU and the US. So it wasn't it was on a good way when I was writing the report, everybody was very positive. And now that the law is out, we know that it might be actually more difficult than we thought for data privacy. Uh, due diligence legislation, this due diligence would require EU companies to respect human social environmental rights across their supply chain and could allow for civil society to sue multinationals in case they don't respect this EU law. It's not final for the moment. And there are some still some exclusions in the law, so financial services, for instance. So um, I don't think it's contradictory because what the EU does with its trade deal is it opens up new supply chains for its big business across the world. It just asks them to respect more the rights, but it's very difficult to know how this law is going to work because first it's not final, but also how the courts are going to interpret the law, how NGOs are going to use or not the law, how how it's going to... Yeah, so it's it's very hard to to give you to compare them, I think, for the moment. And for the EU Commission and small farmers, and um, one day I asked this to the lead um agricultural negotiator. Um so he works on he's a trade negotiator, but he's the lead negotiator for agriculture, sorry. And I asked him, I said, but you know, you're promoting big agricultural farms, you're promoting, yeah. It's not farms anymore to me, they're already fa factories. No? And he said, well, what we want to do is to import cheap agricultural products to the EU in order to feed all the EU citizens. And we want to export high value added products um, to the external world. And I felt like, wow, so you're just thinking of agriculture as, as like a manufacturing product, you know? You're not thinking about how we produce it, about the water, about the people. So. This was the response that I got. And obviously a lot of the time, the discourse is also about, yeah, we were small scale and blah, blah, blah. But as we see with FTAs, the reality is completely different. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and it was much better when you turned off your camera. We, uh, we could hear you crisp and clear. Um, so um, now we have still 15 minutes. So I would say we can give all of the panelists again another three minutes to address some of the questions that had been raised um one question um which probably helmut can answer which is uh, a tough one how can we get negotiators to abandon the free trade approach i don't know if you have an answer to that but um i guess you have uh, a lot to say about everything else that has been said um so it's to you, Helmut, please. Um, thanks, Florian. Uh, probably this question uh, uh, you altogether could not answer. The, the problem is because that is uh, embedded in the logic of the existing capitalist uh, economic uh, structures, uh, both in the EU as well as in India. So uh, therefore, there is no. I don't see any uh, any readiness on the political majorities to to depart from this logic or from this from this approach because that would mean, uh, yeah, uh, in a certain way, a revolution in thinking. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to strive for influencing, uh, pressing, and making proposals to change this logic in the way that the logic for answering the real global challenges needs also a rethinking of the logic. 
So in a certain way, um, I would say learning by doing. And that means we have to learn that our pressure on the way of how we are uh, influencing trade negotiations has a lot of to do with what we can gain, what we have to, to, to do. So I think that is a, the responsibility of the left. And that would also my answer to certain uh, uh, problems and questions we have discussed until now. So I very much agree with the, with the, with the um, uh, idea of markers, to set markers into the, into the economic reality. So, uh, so do we are focusing on health security or food security, or do we focus on market access in the agricultural sector or in trading goods? So that if we, if we change the narrative, we are changing also in a certain way the, the understanding of the logic and to, to put forward this, this narrative change as a left into the, and also in, in accompanying the negotiation processes, but of course also to measuring then the, the achieved or not achieved results in negotiations would be mean that must be in a transparent way then public, uh, go into public and by that also to give the, the citizens as a say in, in, in and, and judging what has been achieved and what has not been achieved. And that leads me to the second remark. I mean, of course, the negotiations are taking place in a, in a certain executive level. Uh, the, the parliament is always trying uh, as much as possible to, to create transparency and include the NGO sector, include the trade unions, include also, of course, uh, the, the economic stakeholders in having uh, um, uh, an understanding what the negotiators are doing. The problem is that we very often have not enforceable mechanisms to deal with uh, the, the question how we can uh, trans transpond that uh, into a broader uh, social um, uh, awareness. And here I see also the, uh, the problem that uh, TSD chapters of course, I agree here with Laura, are a starting point. They are not yet there where we want to have them. And the, and the struggle for enforceability, for, for instruments, for tools, for mechanisms included uh, into the TSD chapters would, of course, create the, 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 the relationship to the other chapters of the agreement. So if we have an overall agreement with a, with a binding and enforceable TSD chapter, of course, it has an influence on the way of how the, 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 the agreed text in other sectors are uh, realized. So that is not, uh, they are not uh, separate, but it is a whole overall agreement. And therefore, the left in the European Parliament is striving for this enforceability. And here I think also that we should discuss even more how we are cooperating, uh, the Indian left and us. Uh, so what does it mean for the Indian, uh, um, for the Indian public, for the Indian politicians, etc., to influence, influence it? So why not to demand to make the, the Indian text available? So why is only the EU approach available? So why, why we have not a parliamentarian debate in the, uh, in the Indian parliament and probably also in the federal states uh, at that level, if you are speaking about the procurement issues. So this is a, this, these are the, the, the concrete examples where we have to, to demand, where we have to come in and to demand um, uh, concrete results and to make the results understandable, transparent, and by that also creating an awareness about um, the, the agreement as such. And finally, uh, we have a lot just now in the, uh, in the European Union uh, on horizontal trade, uh, how to say it, laws now in the, in the, in the pipeline already, already agreed and adopted, and some of them are coming into force. The due diligence legislation is a European legislation. It is forcing European businesses to keep a control about uh, are there human rights violations? Are there labor rights violations? Are there uh, environmental uh, crimes, etc., committed in the value chain? 
this is a huge step forward from my point of view, and it will change totally the way of the future or the trade relationship. But that is targeting European companies at the moment and transnationals one so that they and their with a seat in Europe. In that uh, issue, we, we, we are going into, I think, in, a, in the right direction, also to take the corporate responsibility into the focus, uh, so that we are forcing the, the corporations to deal with human rights, with labor rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that, I think, is one one aspect of the of the struggle of the battle we have to uh, to to leave, and it is not by occasion that a lot of resistance comes from the big corporations, less from the smaller ones, from the small and medium sized corporations, because they are fearing if there is no such an legislation, they have even um, um, more, how to say, it, losses in competition. Uh, than uh, than with uh, with such an uh, due diligence law, and that is also um, uh, true for other horizontal um, uh, trade legislation. Uh, the European Union is organizing for it. Some in a defensive way, some in an offensive way. Generally, uh, finally speaking, um, we will later have in, in May a conference in the European Parliament on beyond growth, so that we should stop to think only in the terms of growth, of economic growth, etc., because the question of the environment, the challenge of the climate catastrophe we are facing means we have to rethink the whole way of the economic realities in, in our societies, and that is true for all of them. And um, if, for example, the Brazilian uh, new elected Brazilian president Lula is saying we have to return also to the question to focus on on poverty reduction, uh, on on uh, on uh, uh, global south cooperation, regional cooperation, circular economies, I think that is all. Uh, these pieces have to put together if you if you want to develop a new, how to say international global um, valuable um, uh, framing of fair cooperation in the interest of the livelihoods of our citizens. Thank you. I would like now to briefly give again uh, the chance to uh, take the floor to uh, Biswajit if you have anything to add. Um, uh, go ahead. But as I said, we have uh, less than eight minutes, so please keep it short. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think um, I would just like to endorse what uh, Helmut said at the end, that I think uh, um, we need a change in narrative. And uh, as long as we become, uh, we, are, we are just, just discussing uh, what is already on the table, we are merely reacting to what is already being uh, uh, put on the table. Um, we have always argued, you know, in the in our the context of our civil society, that um, India needs a proactive, uh, uh, you know, sort of strategy to deal with all these trade trade uh, free trade agreements, and not just the free trade agreements. The larger uh, uh, question of trade integration, we need a we need a uh, 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 a proactive narrative. You know, we are we are far too sort of uh, reactive. We are only reacting to what is there on the table, and uh, we we are not done enough. Now, it's also very important for us. I mean, I mentioned this earlier, but I would like to reiterate that uh, uh, we, there has to be a very active engagement with with the government of India, uh, and uh, to really get from the government of India what its own thinking is about uh, not just the EU-India uh, trade, uh, uh, the free trade agreement, which is the, the largest that we are on the table, but generally its approach towards free trade agreements uh, in, 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 uh, in particular and, and trade in integration in general. So that is very important. And uh, uh, without this, uh, uh, you know, we really can't also, uh, uh, start uh, having a very um, uh, creative um, alternative framework. Uh, it's it's not just enough to have like uh, I would say a, 
a supply side approach you know, that, that we just produce a framework and we try to um, uh, try to be proactive uh, in, in producing a framework. We also need to see how we feed this all into the, uh, the system and create spaces where uh, uh, you know, whatever we are proposing is accepted and taken forward. Now that's a huge task. And I think uh, in, Indian civil society has done it in the past and we, we need to do it. And uh, besides, uh, there used to be a very close cooperation between uh, Indian civil society and the European civil society. Uh, now that doesn't seem to be uh, uh, present now. Uh, at least I'm not aware of it. You know, we had a number of friends in the earlier rounds where uh, we used to uh, interact, exchange notes, and 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 do the best we can. Uh, uh, I think I think we need to get that back. Uh, without uh, the cooperation among the civil society uh, players, I I, I don't think uh, it will be enough for just the Indian um, civil society to take. Uh, 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 you know, uh, to, to take that big step, uh, we need to do. Uh, we, we need to, uh, you know, sort of complete the uh, complete the circle. So uh, that that's all I had to um, uh, say in response to some very useful and uh, enlightening discussion that we had. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and probably Ranja, uh, you have also some last thoughts and something to say on this uh civil society cooperation because you have been involved in these processes for a long time uh yes i mean i think in the earlier phase civil society both in eu and india we were very active i remember delivering these uh the the patient groups delivered plastic coffins to the european commission's office in delhi and it really worked actually i think uh, we were able to kind of, you know, generate a lot of response from civil society. This time, because of COVID and also other reasons, and India is negotiating so many FTAs. I mean, uh, Nicholas was asking, and yes, it is a huge shift in India's uh, trade policy. I mean, this government was kind of more averse to FTAs in the middle. They walked out of RCEP, but now suddenly, and of course, China is a major factor. I think one is to build allies outside China, but India is also hoping to capture some of the displaced maybe investment and business that is that they are thinking will get displaced from China in the current uh, political environment. Uh, but, but given that this, you know, this sudden engagement in many FTAs and with Northern partners simultaneously has also made the civil society, I mean, we have not been ready. And I mean, I mean, we welcome the, I mean, th therefore the work that, you know, RLS has tried to do by, you know, doing this analysis, like triggering some of the thinking and bringing in some analysis. And uh, I think, yeah, I agree with Professor Dhar about the need to work with, you know, on both sides together, because I think all of us are for the same objectives. Uh, and therefore it's, it was great to see Mr. Scholz in, in Delhi. And uh, also, I mean, we would look forward to, I mean, I think this agreement will probably not going to end in 2023 or, I mean, I think 2024 is supposed to be the deadline, but I'm not sure. I mean, because it is a very ambitious agreement. So uh, I don't know whether it will get concluded. So there is time, but I think we really need to get our act together. But in terms of changing the framework, I would say, you know, there's already, as I mentioned, there's already a cooperation agreement between the EU and India. I would say, I mean, frankly, for me, maybe I'm too cynical, but I do not see these very good constructive things coming in through trade agreements because the main agenda is extremely problematic. And, you know, even if we are trying to get these uh, new kind of development issues in, um, they don't seem to work because the commercial objective is so strong and between and it is still a north south ft i mean though india is so called emerging economy etc it still has massive poverty inequality and therefore these kind of ambitious ftas which are as professor dhar was saying that indian negotiators may not be fully even prepared for even indus indian industry does not know what's coming i mean i think these the, this, I mean, it would be a challenge to get this kind of a model to actually work for development or for human rights or, you know, sustainability. Yeah, I think I'll end here. Thank you very much, Ranja. And now, uh, Laura, for the very last thoughts, very short, please. Um, the floor is yours. I agree with Renya. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't think uh, it, uh, the negotiations will end in 2024. I think it will take some time. I think we can win because we are prepared at a very early moment. So I thank you again for raising already um, the fact that this agreement is coming up because I think it was out of the radar of many civil society organizations, at least in Europe. So the idea is now we have information, we have people that are ready to share information and and when it will become clear and the deadline will come really soon, I think we'll have the means to mobilize. And I just would like one thing is the one hope that I have is that it's I would I wish it's not the extreme rights in Europe that stops the agreement. I really, really hope that it's not because we want to have more Indian workers coming to the EU that mm -hmm. this will actually block the agreement. I hope that we have a, re a strong leftist movement with different opinions, as we've seen today. Uh, both in India and both in the EU that can mobilize and show that we can have a different uh, trade agenda and don't leave this criticism of EU trade to the extreme right, but mobilize before them and show them that the left also has ideas for a better world. And the left has this for a couple of hundred years now, uh, the better ideas for a better world. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for these uh, last words. Um, and uh, as Laura and the others said, I hope this debate could steer interest within civil society uh, on both sides of the ocean, which ocean is it actually, um, to, to work on this agreement. Um, thanks to our distinguished speakers, uh, Helmut Scholz, Biswat, Jit, Dar, Ranja, Singupta, and Laura Fehecke. And I also ask you to look into their reports. They are very informative um, if you didn't do that yet. And um, thanks also to the colleagues working in the background. That would be uh, Julie, uh, Nadia, and Christina. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you again. And uh, we keep uh, working on these issues. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everyone. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, and hopefully meet in person somewhere and sometime. Yeah. In of soon. course. <laughs> thank See you. you. Thank you, Florian. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.